Good morning, everyone. Let's get it started with the lecture 18. Today, you're going to start, or we're going to look at a new machine. We're going to look at asynchronous machines. In the last lecture, we dealt with uh, induction motors. And today, you're going to see a small variation of an induction motor that's called a synchronous machine. And you'll see that the, there's only one fundamental difference in the way these machines are built, but that will make them uh, work in a completely different way. So well, that's what we're going to see today. And then you have one more type of special machine in lecture 19, which is single phase induction motors or uh, synchronous motors. And then the last lecture will be transient and transient of DC machines or, or any machine. And then the last lecture will be a review. And then we are pretty much done with the content uh, of this course. So for today, we're going to focus on synchronous machines. And by the end of the lecture, you should be able to model a synchronous machine, find the equivalent transformer model that describes the behavior of these machine and estimate the torque developed in a synchronous machine. We'll mostly see synchronous machines working as generators. Here is one in a power station. They are typically employed not as a motor, but most of the time as a generator. What is the main difference between this machine and an induction machine? That's what we're going to see in the lecture today. Here is the example of one, is a turbine connected to a hydraulic system, I believe. And uh, it works as a generator where we have an external power turning the rotor and the rotor creates an alternating magnetic field that induces current in the stator and this three phase current it does capture and sends to a power grid. This picture is not, showing very well, but it's showing on your side probably. This is a synchronous motor and you see here they have three wires for a three phase input and you also have two additional wires that go to the rotor. Why do we have now this additional supply? What is the difference between this and a um, induction motor? For the DC machines, uh, the AC machines that we're dealing with, most of these machines are large machines such as these ones. And in particular for synchronous motors, they are mostly used for applications that require a constant speed. And you may guess why, because based on the frequency we apply to these machines, they will run at a certain speed. Now changing that frequency is relatively complicated from the electronic side. So these motors are typically more suitable for systems that operate at a constant speed. We're going to see how they work and why, uh, how we can control the torque and the speed in this type of motors. So let's get right into it. So the operating principle of a induction machine uh, was covered in the last lecture. We had a rotating magnetic field and a stator that uh, had a coil. That a coil was short circuited like that. And as the AC supply is applied to this three phase um, stator, we have a, a changing magnetic field that rotates at a given speed, which depends on the input frequency. That creates a changing EMF in the rotor. The rotor develops a current, and then it starts to rotate at a lower speed than that of the synchronous speed. There is no, no power supply applied to an induction machine. So here is the difference compared to a synchronous motor. In the synchronous motor, we have the same strategy, the same configuration, but now we are going to apply a DC supply to the coil that is in the rotor. So we have still a three phase AC going to the stator that is distributed in the same way it was in an induction machine that creates a magnetic field that rotates at a given speed. The difference now is that the rotor is also powered, but it is powered with a DC supply. So we have the winding for the rotor and the stator. The stator is exactly the same as the induction machine and the rotor. It's only difference again is that it now has an external power supply, a DC, and it has its own current. That is now not induced by the changing magnetic field. It is supplied by an external power source. This motor, as it operates, we can see the stator now as the same as the induction motor and the rotor could be seen as a permanent magnet, for example. So as we apply this voltage, there will, be a, there will be a magnetic field developed in the rotor, and you could see this as a magnet. That is to say that if we take 
this rotor that is now powered with an external supply and rotate that at a given speed and we measure the induced EMF along this coil, we should see a sinusoidal waveform forming in this coil. If you take coil B and measure the voltage induced in coil B as the rotor rotates at a given speed, we shall see the same type of waveform, but only shifted by a certain amount compared to coil A. And if you do coil C, it will be the same, again, shifted by the same amount. This would be as op uh, if the motor operates as a generator. So here is what happens now with the stator, uh, with, with, with the rotor. The rotor now becomes some sort of a permanent magnet. And you can replace that with a permanent magnet with a, a south and a north pole as shown. The problem with this approach is that the system is not self-starting, which means that if you turn this motor on, it's not going to rotate, it will vibrate. And you can explain that easily. Consider again the induction motor that has the three phase in the stator, and that creates a changing magnetic field. I'm gonna call that magnetic field B, and this magnetic field now rotates at a given speed. Here I represented this magnetic field as this coil that it has a ferromagnetic path and you know, here is creating the magnetic field like that. But it's the same representation. It is created from a DAC supply. Now let's assume that we have, let's say a four pole machine uh, at 60 Hertz. So a four pole machine at 60 Hertz will rotate at, this field will rotate at 1800 RPM. So it's very fast. And when you rotate the field, it is equivalent to simply rotating this entire stator from 180 degrees in this example. So this will happen uh, at a speed of 1800 RPM in the example we've chosen. So what happens here? Let's see the first example. In the first example, the magnetic field is oriented upwards like that. So it creates a south pole at the bottom, a north pole at the top. What is the torque created? In the rotor, we see that the north and the south pole will attract, and that will result in a clockwise torque. Torque will be clockwise, then the magnetic field is rotating fast, and the, immediately after that, now the magnetic field will be rotated by 180 degrees, say. What is the torque now? Well, now you see that the magnetic field points downwards, the south pole is at the top, the north pole is at the bottom, what is the torque applied to the magnet? Now we see that north and north will repel and the torque is now created in the counterclockwise direction. And the process repeats. Now we go back to the first one. Remember that it is, is a continuous rotation. Here I'm taking two snapshots at zero and 180 degrees. In one case, the motor uh, experiences a torque clockwise, the other uh, in the other instant counterclockwise. So what happens in the end, it simply vibrates, it does not start. Unless we manually start to rotate the motor and then eventually it will follow the frequency, the, the speed of the, the uh, magnetic field, right? And that's precisely why we call this a synchronous motor. Because unlike the induction machine that rotates at a lower, lower speed than the synchronous speed, once the, uh, the synchronous motor starts to rotate, it will rotate at the synchronous speed. It will follow this magnetic field line and it will always be aligned with it. Once it starts to rotate, but the motor is not self-starting. Question. Yeah. Is that because of the inertia of this, the rotor? So like once we solve start it and it's going in one rotation and or once we start it ourselves and it's going in a specific rotation, is its own inertia overcoming the opposite turn? Is that why or no? Uh, well, n no, it's well in the beginning, yes, is the effect of inertia because you, you are changing the direction of torque too fast and the motor doesn't have time to respond. Right, so it will just vibrate. If it didn't have inertia, it would follow it, but the inertia will make it vibrate. And once it starts to rotate, it is basically taking one magnet and another and moving the magnets together. Right? Once they are in synchrony, they will just follow each other. Okay. 
right? But the inertia does play a role in the beginning when you know, you're just changing torques clockwise and counterclockwise too fast. The motor is some sort of low pass filter because of inertia and friction, and it doesn't have time to develop a speed. But let's maybe to answer your question a bit better, here is an example where the motor would be self-starting. What if we start with a very low frequency? There's a very, very low frequency. Then what is, is happening here? Well, we have the magnet and you have the magnetic field and that, that is going on a very small speed. So the rotor has time to actually develop a speed and follow the, or the rotating magnetic field. And in that case, it would be self-starting. If we start the motor at a high frequency, it's not going to self-start. But if we stay, let's say at one hertz, we do one revolution per second, and the rotor has sufficient time to develop a speed and it will eventually follow the magnetic field. And then we can slowly increase the frequency, the synchronous frequency to reach the nominal speed. That's an option. So here we have the driver that would be required for such an operating mode. We have an H bridge that will control each of this, uh, a three phase inverter, I should say, that controls each of the phase uh, in the stator, we would need a three-phase inverter to determine the sequence of activation. We need a carrier signal and we need the reference sinusoidal waveform as we saw before at a varying frequency. So we would start the motor at a very low frequency, give it time to develop a speed and then slowly change the frequency from the inverter here up to the nominal frequency. So I think this probably explains answers the question a bit better. Now, the problem with this configuration is that you need a three-phase inverter. We need all these electronics connected to the motor and it's expensive to implement. It is uh, also, there's a lot that can go wrong here. So now let's think about this and propose a alternative solution. Well, how else could we get this motor to start? Does anybody have any idea? Any, any ideas? You could turn the DC power supply off first. Okay, okay, very well. Let's turn off the DC power supply. Would the motor self start? If we turn off the power supply, then there is no external power acted to the, uh, being supplied to the motor. I think it would, it would probably have the same, the same problem. Even if it's a reluctance motor, it will, no, you actually, you are right. If you turn off, if we are dealing with a reluctance motor, if you're dealing with a re, the reluctance of the ferromagnetic path, then you would, would likely follow it. Okay, good. Uh, any other solutions? Any other potential solution? So the solution was if you turn off the rotor and provided that the core is ferromagnetic, that it could potentially start. It would start at a very low, very low speed, but it would start. Any other solution? You could add a startup motor. You can add a startup motor. Yes, yeah, definitely. That would add more to the system, but you could definitely add a starter motor. What else? What else? Think about a solution that doesn't require much changes in the system. Any, any other ideas? What yeah. if you increase the frequency? What if you increase the frequency? If you decrease the frequency and then increase the frequency, yes, that's what this schematic here is doing. Right? It's varying the frequency so we can get the motor to start. Okay, very well. Any other ideas? Maybe um, disconnect the DC source and short it. Ah, there we go. Disconnect the DC source and short it. That's the answer I was looking for. Basically, we are starting this as an induction motor. If we just short the supply, that's an ingenious solution. Just short the supply here or disconnect it, of course, to avoid a short circuit. And we open the circuit and connect it like that. What happens? This becomes an induction motor. And we know that the induction motor is self-starting. Induction motor is self-starting. So we can start this machine as an induction motor by, by disconnecting the power supply and shortening the input, the, the power to the rotor. It will now become a induction motor that will start, will reach its 
speed, which is not the synchronous speed, is very close to the synchronous speed, let's say 5, 10% of the synchronous speed. And when you're very close to the synchronous speed, what do we do? Well, then connect it back to the supply. Connect it back to the supply, and then it becomes a synchronous motor. And once the supply is now connected, what is the speed of the motor? It is the synchronous speed. What is the slip factor in a synchronous motor then? What is the slip factor in a synchronous One. motor? One. One would be in this in, in oh, standard zero. Yeah. zero. Yeah, zero. It would be zero because it rotates at the synchronous speed, right? So that's one solution. Here is another schematic. Have the same power supply that is now simply a three-phase power supply. It doesn't need the inverter. You start as an induction motor by shortening the input and then connect the DC supply to reach the synchronous speed. Very good, very good. Now let's start the fun part and create an equivalent circuit model to represent this motor that will allow us to estimate the torque and speed. Here we have basically two coils. We have the coil in the, they're going to call the field coil and we have the stator coil. The field coil is represented here. It has, uh, it induced EMF, it creates its own magnetic flux and it has a current IF. That's the rotor side. And on the stator side, we have something similar that here we are going to represent as a input voltage. That's the, the AC input voltage going to the stator. We have a magnetic field that it will experience, or sorry, we have a induced EMF that it will experience because of the changing magnetic field in the air gap that is the same for both the rotor and the stator. And we have here another voltage that is representing here the leakage magnetic flux, that magnetic flux that it doesn't make it to the air gap, that it just leaks, uh, just leaks outside of the air gap. So for the one we apply ER, when you apply the supply input voltage, part of that magnetic field that you generate here, you're going to call the total magnetic field, magnetic flux phi A, part is lost, part, part goes to the, uh, that doesn't loop in the air gap, and part of it then goes to the air gap, that's phi r, a r. We have a magnetic flux coming from the stator. They are both added in the air gap, and the total magnetic field in the air gap, or magnetic flux right there, we're going to call that phi r, which is the net magnetic field from the rotor, from the stator plus that one generated from the motor. This is the equivalent magnetic circuit. EA here represents that induced EMF that we see because of this interaction. And EAR is a back EMF that represents the magnetic field lost in the leakage flux. So the total magnetic field created by the rotor, uh, sorry, by the, the stator is the leakage magnetic field, AL plus the one that it makes it to the air gap. And this is the effective one now that is added to the one created by the DC supply, all right? So here we have the total magnetic field and the magnetic field is common to both coils. Now let's take this approach one step ahead and let's assume only, the, or let's neglect the leakage magnetic field. And let's try to represent this circuit from the stator's perspective only. So here we have the magnetic field that is common to both, that's phi r, that induces this EMF. And you're going to represent this magnetic field that is lost here by the uh, leakage reactance as a reactance itself. So the assumption is that uh, this leakage magnetic field is going to be similar to a reactance like that. So the reactance times the current times J. All right, this is the drop in EMF that is created by the leakage magnetic flux. This is the induced EMF from the rotation of the rotor and this is the input to the stator. Okay, 
So if we now do Kirchhoff's law on either side of this, we get this expression ER equals to EIR, -E which is the one across this reactance plus the one created by the rotation of the rotor. If you now apply the, 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 this equality that we created for ER, we can calculate a new expression for the equation that balances the voltage as EF equals to the sum of ER plus IA XRA, right? Where, where XRA is the armature reactance that here represents the reactance and the loss magnetic field. Now we can represent that a circuit in this format, which is a lot simpler to, to work with. And this reactance is the synchronous reactance. We are dealing with a steady state operation. So that reactance only represents the, the motor in a steady state when it rotates at the synchronous speed. Okay. So the total reactance includes the armature reactance and the leakage reactance just as in information. And we also have the resistance of the winding. And this, both, both here, we're going to just create a total reactance and just put one reactance that represents everything. The reactance of the coil itself and the leakage flux. And then we have this resistance added to represent, of course, the resistance of the winding. What is the total impedance in the system? Well, the total impedance in the system is the reactance, the total reactance that we're going to call here after X, S, and the resistance of the winding, okay? So the circuit becomes very simple. And then you have this input voltage here that it comes from the induction voltage from the rotating magnetic field in the air gap. There is another way to model this. We're going to skip this part, but it's just to tell you that uh, we could create a model that will show that the induced current in the stator depends on the magnitude of the induced current in the rotor, which makes perfect sense. It's a transformer. And if you increase the strength of the magnetic field, the current induced here will also increase. So if we use an equivalent circuit, we could use the, uh, we could use Norton, Norton circuit to represent this induced EMF as a voltage source. And this voltage source would depend on the, sorry, a current source, as a current source. And this magnitude of this current would depend on the magnitude of the current applied to the rotor. This is the same circuit. And we can clearly show, it would be easy to show that it depends on the ratio between the number of turns in the stator and the rotor. Right? It's just an equivalent way to model the circuit we have, we are going to stick with the one on the left. It's easier. The only information I wanted to take from the one on the right is that we can see that the induced EMF depends on the magnitude of the current applied to the rotor. And that makes, again, perfect sense. Okay. But we don't need to worry about that one. All right. So now let's create a per phase equivalent circuit. So here we have the three elements to consider the reactance of the winding the induced EMF EF and the resistance of the winding RA and our input voltage that are going to call here VT. This is the external supply. Our, we'll see here that now we have to consider the angle, the phase shift between all these elements. And to do that, let's consider our, our reference voltage to be VT. So this is a represents a phase of zero. VT is the reference voltage and has an angle of zero. Let's also assume that now our input here, your EMF that is generated uh, there has an angle of, um, is that delta? It looks like delta. That's delta and we're going to call that the power angle or the torque angle. It's a phase shift to compare to the reference voltage. If we look at this reactance, this reactance would be, the total impedance would be Z equals to J uh, X S plus R A, which has an angle in itself. And the angle would be the arc tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. And let's call this angle theta. 
So here are the three angles to consider. The reference is zero, the power angle or the angle of the induced EMF with respect to the reference is delta and theta is the angle of, of the impedance itself, the, or the wind. Now, what is the current in the system? Well, the current is easy to calculate. It's just the voltage drop, EF minus VT, divided by ZS, the total impedance. EF has an angle of zero. Sorry, EF has an angle of theta. VT has an angle of zero. Z, let me try that again. EF has an angle of delta, VT has an angle of zero, and Z has an angle of theta. So now we can split that equation into EF divided by Z minus VT divided by Z. The first term simplifies to this. If we put the angles, we can simply look at the magnitude of this division at an angle that is theta minus delta. And for the second part here, we have VT with an angle of zero, Z with an angle of theta, that becomes VT over Z with an angle of theta. Uh, that's the current in, in the system. And you see the components of the current here that will now depend on the angle theta, the impedance angle makes sense. And of course, the uh, angle of the input voltage from the rotor rotation. Question? Yeah. In, in the last slide, did it? term disappear in the third part of that equation? It did. Yeah, okay. it accidentally did. So this term here, there's this minus VT over ZS is missing there. Yeah. I was I noticed this this morning. I didn't have time to fix it. And I was hoping that nobody would notice it. So VT over ZS, right, which is this term here. Question. Yeah. Uh, why why does theta become negative here uh, um, at the bottom when you're dividing? Yeah. So it becomes negative because it's uh, an impedance load. So the we assume that the current will lag the voltage. It will lag the voltage. Okay. Okay. So here we have now, so we have an expression for the current. Now, what is the power developed in the system? Well, the power is simply the voltage times the current, the input voltage times the current. So you take the expression for the current we had before, these two terms, multiply that by VT, the input voltage. So the second term now has VT squared, one VT comes from the current, the other VT is the one we just multiplied by. And the other term is the first term we calculated earlier times VT. So this is the total power in the system, the reactive plus the real power. We can now split the total power S, which is this big vector here, into a reactive and a um, complex, sorry, reactive and uh, real power. So just depend on the angle theta there or the angle theta minus phi minus delta, depending on which one you're dealing with. And we now have the two components of the power in equations 11 and 12. So the reactive and which is the one dissipated somewhere and the, uh, sorry, the reactive, the one that is uh, because of the complex part of the impedance and the real, that's the one that is going to be dissipated or transferred as rotation to the motor. Now, Typically, if you look at our circuit, so these are the two components. You know, we just added the cosine and sine of E for to just put that into two vectors. When the rotor rotates, we can assume that the rotor uh, resistance will be negligible compared to its reactance. So we can, for simplicity, assume that rotor resistance goes to zero. If that is the case, then the real part is zero of the impedance. Right, this would be the real, the imaginary. The real part of the impedance is zero, which means that the angle of the impedance theta is now 90 degrees. If R is zero. Okay, now go back to our equations here and replace theta 
with z uh, with uh, 90 degrees so this would be 90 degrees 90 degrees this term goes to zero and this term becomes uh, cosine of sine of theta this one becomes cosine of theta and this one becomes a vt the sine of theta a 90 is one so when you do that simplification this is what we get s theta is assumed to be zero to start to be 90 degrees so one term for the real uh, power disappears and the complex power just changes from sine to cosine and one of them now tends to uh one very well so these are the two powers what is the torque developed in the motor well the torque developed in the motor will depend on the real power on the useful power by the motor and because we assume that the resistance of the winding is negligible, there is no power losses. That means that the entire, re, uh, the entire real power must be converted into mechanical power. The entire real power must be converted into mechanical power because, the because of the assumption that the resistance of the winding is zero. How do we calculate the torque then? Well, the torque is, calculated by equating the mechanical power torque times the speed with the electrical power, the real part of the power. And notice here, this term is multiplied by three because again, the circuit we determined was for one phase. We have three phases, hence we multiply the power of each phase by three to get the total power. Equate that to the mechanical power that is torque times the speed and we get now an expression for the speed. What is the speed of the rotor? It's a synchronous machine, so it's the synchronous speed. It is a synchronous motor, so we are dealing with the synchronous speed. And this power that we are dealing with is the real power there, and here we have now the expression for the torque three times the input voltage times the induced EMF because of the rotor's rotation and the reactance sine of delta and also depending on the synchronous speed. What can we conclude here? We can conclude that the torque will depend on the power angle delta. Now let's plot it here. We see that the higher the power, the higher the torque, well, that makes sense. And that's a function of the power angle. The maximum occurs at 90 degrees when they are exactly shifted by 90 degrees. The minimum occurs at zero. And that means there would be no load. So if theta is zero, the motor produces no torque. We are here. Sorry, not theta. I keep mixing them up. Delta. If delta is zero, then torque is zero because the motor would then have no load. The maximum torque occurs at an angle of 90 degrees when sine of 90 is one, okay? And omega is the synchronous speed. If the motor exceeds 90 degrees, if this angle exceeds 90 degrees, the motor will lose synchrony, right? The motor can only operate at the synchronous speed. If the torque becomes too high and you now exceed 90 degrees, you see that the torque here will change sign. The motor will lose synchrony and it will not rotate properly. So if the, the torque is decreasing, is increasing this angle too much, we may need to adjust the voltage to get that angle below 90 degrees so that it always follows the rotating magnetic field. It's a fixed speed. The synchronous speed determines the motor speed, which means that the motor speed is independent of the load. The motor speed is independent of the load, which is a good advantage when you want to do speed control. You can put any load on the motor and it will run at the synchronous speed. There is no need to account for uh, changes in, in the load because it doesn't affect the speed, unless it creates an angle, uh, power angle delta that is greater than 90 degrees in which case we would need to adjust the voltage VT to lower that angle 
before the rotor loses synchrony with the magnetic field. Okay, so in a synchronous machine, if it operates, it always operates at the synchronous speed. The torque does not affect, the load does not affect the speed of this machine, all right? And you can see that in the equations here, if you take uh, the, the torque equation, we can calculate the synchronous speed. We, we, we had an expression for the synchronous speed before that was synchronous speed equals to 120 times the frequency divided by the number of poles. This is in radians per second. And the, that in, um, sorry, that is in RPM and in radians per second, it would be that times two pi divided by 60. You combine these two equations. This is the synchronous speed in radians per second. It's a function of the input frequency. The reactance of the winding is also a function of the input frequency. The EMF induced in the generator in, in the rotor is also a function of the input frequency times a constant. So if you combine all these equations, we should see an expression for the torque that resembles this, a constant K. You can try that, combine equations 17, 18, and 19 in equation 16 and simplify it all. We'll get some form of equation 12, where K is a constant that will depend on some of the constants here. VT is the input voltage and theta, uh, delta is the power angle. What can you conclude from equation 12? Well, if you want to know to do torque control, we must control the input voltage. If you want to do torque control, we control the input voltage. How do you control the speed? How do we control the speed? Isn't it just a function of the frequency or is the P term? Yeah, exactly. It's just a function of the speed, of the frequency. When you apply a certain frequency to the rotor winding, it creates the alternating magnetic field at the synchronous frequency, and that's the frequency the motor rotates at. So we control the speed through the frequency, and you control the torque through the input voltage. Right, And once again, if the motor operates properly, the load torque should have no effect on the speed of the motor because that is defined by the synchronous speed that is defined by the input frequency to the motor and the number of poles it has. Question. Yeah. Uh, so on slide 16, I just wanted to ask what if so sigma doesn't ever go to 180? Sigma will not, not, not go to 180. Uh, delta will not go to 180. No. Okay. All right. Yeah. If it pass beyond nine degrees, you see that the torque sign will revert, it may revert, and then the system will lose synchrony. Okay. So the maximum torque occurs at that specific point. All right, so now let's do an open loop speed and torque control here. This would be one way to do it. There are other ways. We have a rectifier that it takes an AC input to a auto transformer. Uh, what is the rectifier here? If there is an auto transformer. I think they're they are flipped. They're certainly flipped. This is the transformer. And this is the rectifier. I'm putting an auto transformer after a rectifier doesn't make any sense. Let's fix that. So this is the auto transformer. And this is the rectifier. So you can now take an AC input, convert that into a DC. From a DC, take an inverter and convert that back into AC. Why? Because with this inverter, with the three phase inverter, we can determine the frequency we want in the output. Whereas this input voltage here has a fixed frequency. So convert that into DC back to AC 
And in the process, we can now specify which frequency we want this output to be at. In the rectifier, we can have a control gain or in the auto transformer to now increase the effective voltage we get from, from it. This will now determine the speed. Uh, sorry, it will determine the torque. I think uh, it will determine the torque, right? So this is the speed voltage, which we change again, we can control the torque and what goes to the inverter is the frequency and that determines now the, the speed. Right? You just input, uh, you increase the entire voltage going to the converter that it will increase the torque. So frequency controls the speed, voltage controls the torque. Here's another implementation of a in, uh, synchronous machine. We could think about a linear version of it where we have now two plates that are translate with respect to each other. We have in the induction motor, simply the stator has coils that now create an alternating magnetic field that is simply translating like that, that induces a current in the rotor and the system may become a induction machine if we close the path for the, the, the current to develop. Or we can have permanent magnets in the stator, in the rotor, and then those permanent magnets will always follow the speed of the magnetic field. That's another implementation, both for synchronous and induction machine. Another variation of this is the uh, brushless DC motor. In this case here, we have a three uh, a three phase input with a drive uh, that it will now control the orientation of the magnetic field and the permanent magnet inside that operates like the external uh, externally excited rotor in the case of the synchronous motor. Right? The complication with this type of motor is that we do need to create the alternating magnetic field. We do need to properly time the activation of the coils to properly follow, make the rotor follow a specific speed. Right, it's then a variation of a synchronous mode. Okay. All right, so that's it for synchronous machines. You see that the analysis is a lot easier than um, the induction. The circuit is relatively simpler. Any questions before we do some exercising? Some exercises. No? No? All right. So if there are no questions, let's do a few exercises. Let's just start with 83. We have a three phase four pole synchronous machine that operates at 208 phase to phase voltage. So the phase to neutral would be 288 divided by square root of three in a three phase system at 60 Hertz. The fixed excitation is adjusted so that the power factor is unit when the machine draws three kilowatts from the source. The synchronous reactance per phase is eight ohms. Determine the excitation voltage of the rotor, EF, the power angle, del uh, delta, and the maximum torque that the motor can deliver. All right, so let's do that. Here is the problem. We have an excitation voltage here. That's out of my reach. It's eight, 208 divided by square root of 3. Right, because 208 is phase to phase, it's divided by square root of three is phase to neutral. And the reactance here is 8J, the, the resistance is zero. The first question is what is this value here when drawing at this much power at this power angle? So let's do that. So question, first question is A, how do we do that? What is the power, total power in this circuit? So this is the power it takes. So this is for three phases. So the total power 
electrical power is three times VT times the current times cosine of theta, and this is the for to consider the power factor, and this is three. How much is that? Three kilo ohms. Three kilowatts. Okay, I think I have this mixed up in my. Yeah, yeah, I have this mixed up here. So these values are for a different example. So let me just fix this. This should be 208. This should be eight. I think you're mixing up values from exercise 83. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, so this part here has values from the other exercise. The circuit is correct. Yeah, the circuit is correct, but it's just the uh, top here. These values are incorrect. Well, sir, it looks like you might be using the values from exercise 84 yeah. instead of 83. Yeah, so neglect this part here. Uh, this part is from a different exercise, but the, the circuit is correct. Yeah, the circuit is, is correct. Oh, wait, sorry, are we doing 83 or 84? We are doing exercise 83. Okay. Right, exercise 83, so the circuit is correct. Just neglect this part here. I can't remove it right now. So this is taken from a different exercise is my mistake. So why is it cosine? It's the power factor. It's always cosine. Yeah. It's not sine. It's, no, it's cosine. It's a power factor for a in any sort of uh, reactive power, real power. So the yellow part here is. Yeah, he's even taken from the other one as well. All right, so just let's look at the this part of the circuit. The qu first question is the excitation voltage of the motor EF. So we have the power drawn here, which is, let me look at the three kilowatts, right? So this is three kilowatts, 300, three kilowatts, 3000 watts. The problem says that at this specific configuration, the power factor is unit. So this is now one. Uh, the voltage and the current are in phase, that's uh, one. So from this, we can calculate the current. The current is 3000 divided by three, that's the three times VT. So VT is, two, is 208 divided by square root of three. And this gives, 8.33 amps. Yep. Uh, can you repeat why the cosine, why there's a cosine there? Because there is a power factor. Uh, okay. There's a power factor. So there is, when you consider the power, you need to consider the angle between the input, the voltage and the current. Hence cosine of theta. If we are assuming that the power factor is a unit, then the voltage and the current are both in phase, but it did, may not be the case. Right? It may not be the case for inductive loads where that will play a, play a role. So the, there will be a discrepancy between the real and the reactive power. If the power factor is one, they, then you're dealing with the real power. Good question. Yeah. So uh, in uh, equation 16, we wouldn't be able to use it. The one that's three times VT. Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. All right. So let's now calculate EF. We can calculate EF by doing Kirchhoff's law there. EF equals to VT minus IA times the reactance times J. So EF equals to VT, which is 208 divided by square root of three, that's 120 minus the current 
times the reactance of the winding, which is 8J. This gives EF as 120 minus 66.44J. We can calculate now the magnitude of this as a square root of 120 square plus 66.44 and EF magnitude of EF is 137 volts per phase. A simple circuit. So this is for A. For B, what is the power angle? Well, the power angle will be the angle between EF uh, and the reference voltage. So we can calculate the power angle based on the angle of this voltage here, which is simply, what is the power angle? Let's go this B, the power angle delta. If you look at the voltage here, would be the, the angle between the angle of this voltage here, which is the angle with respect to the input voltage. So that is the arc tangent of its real part divided by the ima imaginary part divided by the real part, 66.44 divided by 120, which gives negative 29 degrees. So we can write EF as 137 negative 29 degree volts. And this angle is the power angle delta that we are looking for. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm still a little confused. What slide is that power equation from the 3VT IA cos theta? This is the entire, this is not from a slide. This is just the power taken from the motor is the current times the, uh, this is the electrical power going in. We are not calculating the, um, the, uh, the, the, the power, we can calculate the power in two ways. We can do the equation we had, which is the entire power from the system that we converted into mechanical power. And that is equal to the input power to the motor if you consider the reactive power only. This is simply the mechanical, the electrical power that goes in the circuit, the total power, the voltage times the current is not necessarily from the slides. It's just a basic power equation for an electrical system, voltage mm -hmm. times current, right? And then the, if you consider the real particle sign of the power of, of the angle here, and then three, because you have three phases. Okay, okay. now let's do C, if this, is, this one is fine. Question C, determine the field, uh, if the field excitation is increased, determine the maximum torque that the motor can deliver. At which point does the maximum torque occur? When the power angle is zero. When the power angle is zero. And you can see that from the equation because the electrical, the, the power that is transferred to the motor as mechanical power is three VT EF over XS times sine of the power angle. So when this will reach maximum, when this is one, right? And that requires that to be 90 degrees. And what is the torque? The torque would be the power divided by the synchronous speed in radians per second. We can calculate uh, this. Yep. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, you wrote delta is equal to zero. Should it be delta is equal to 90? Yes, sorry. Yes, oh. would be 90. Yeah. What happens at, sorry. Yeah, that is correct. What happens with delta is uh, nine, zero. Delta is zero when we have no load. Yeah, that's my confusion. I I'm, I'm, was thinking about the next example. So delta is zero when there is no load. If we want the maximum torque, yes, then this must be one, which requires 90 degrees, correct. Thank you. So now we have everything for the power here, three times VT it is 120 times EF calculated here, 137 divided by 
xs, which is 8. And this gives a total of 16,180 watts. Uh, what is the 120 Sorry. and the 8 from? Where, where is the? 120 and the 8 coming from. 120 is VT. It's 208 divided by square root of 3. And 8 is the reactance XS, which is this one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, I'm getting uh, 6,165. Six, you're getting here 6,000? Yeah, 6,165. Okay, That's good. good. Good, that makes more sense because that was intriguing me about the, this would be greater than, uh, would be greater than the input power. So 6,100, could, could you repeat the num number here? 6,100? 6, 6,165. 65, okay, that makes more sense, watts. All right. Yeah, that's the numbers I have. I don't know where I got 16,000 from. Very well. Now they have the power, we can calculate the torque. To calculate the torque, we need the synchronous speed. What is the synchronous speed for this motor? We need the synchronous speed in radians per second. And the synchronous speed is, according to the equations before, 4 pi times F divided by 60. So we have a 60 hertz machine divided by, sorry, divided by P. Number of poles is four, and this gives 1800, not 1800, 188.49 radians per second. Right, four pi times the frequency divided by the number of poles. The torque can now be calculated as the power divided by the synchronous speed. Can someone calculate this for me, please? This divided by that. Thirty-two point seven. Thirty-two point, yep. Yeah, that's what I had at the end here. So my result was correct. I just I don't know where I got this number from. Probably must, must have copied this from my other notes. Wrong. Okay, so this is the synchronous speed, and because the motor rotates at a synchronous speed, there is no need to calculate slip. That is always um, zero in a, in, a, in a synchronous motor. Power divided by speed. Here we have the total torque. Okay. Any questions? Oh yeah, uh, do you mind just explaining um, in part B um, where the 66.4 came from? That's uh, 8.33 times eight. And why is it negative? The negative is coming all the way from the expression here. I just, it, it, we are looking for this voltage. So this voltage here equals to this voltage drop plus this voltage drop. Now isolate for EF, we get input voltage minus that. All right, from, from this expression here. EF equals to VT minus that, or VT, the input voltage equals to the voltage drop across all other elements, which is the reactance voltage drop. That's right here, plus the one that comes from the rotating magnetic field. I, that's where the negative comes from. I forgot a square here. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> 
Nope. If there are no questions, let's move on to exercise 84. We have a three phase, 2300 volt, 60 hertz synchronous motor. It has a synchronous reactance of 11 ohms per phase. When you draw 16.5 kilowatts from the source, the power angle is 15 degrees. Neglect the resistive losses. Determine the excitation voltage per phase and determine the supply line current and the line current when the load is removed. Let me erase the light board and then we'll do that one. All right, so this is exercise 84. Hopefully this one is correct now. Okay, so three phase, 200, 2,300 volts, 60 hertz synchronous motor has synchronous reactance of 11 ohm per, uh, per phase. When drawn on the now from the source, the power angle is 15 degrees. And determine the excitation voltage per phase, EF. So let's do question eight. All right, let's start question eight. What is the total power in the system? Well, at, because we have the power angle, we can use the expression for the mechanical power directly. So all the markers decided to not function. One sec. There you go. We can use the power as 3VT EF divided by X times the sine of the power angle because the power angle is given. And it's drawing that much from the source and because you're neglecting now the rewinding resistance, we can assume that this power that it draws from the source goes into mechanical power. So this expression is valid. This VT, the v VT is the input voltage, which is 2300. This is phase to phase divided by square root of three gives 1,328 uh, 1, volts phase to neutral. If you are interested in the Excitation voltage EF, we can isolate EF here. EF becomes P times X divided by three sine of um, delta. P is the power drawn from the source. Again, assuming that the resistive power is neglected, uh, the resistance of the winding is neglected. All this input power goes to the mechanical side of the motor. So everything is converted into mechanical power. 16, one, uh, 165.8, that is kilowatts. So 10 times, uh, times 10 to the power of three times X, which is the reactance of the winding times 11 divided by three sign of the power angle, which is given as 15 degrees. So this gives uh, F as... Did you forget VT and the denominator, sir? Is there a VT in the denominator? Yes, yes there is a VT. Yeah. The VT is 13, 28. Okay, so that is 17, if I calculated this correctly, 69, an angle of negative 15 degrees. Right, the angle that was given. So now having this voltage will allow us to calculate the current. And what is the current in this system? Well, it's simply the voltage drop 
VT minus EF divided by the reactance of the winding. VT is known, is 1328 at an angle of zero. EF is what we just calculated, 1769 at an angle of negative 15 degrees. And the reactance is 11 with an angle of 90 degrees, right? Because it's a complex quantity. From this, you can calculate a AS 54.14 at an angle of 39.8 degrees. Sorry, this should be just 15. I don't know why I put negative there. It's specified as 15 degrees. That's just 15. Okay, so you know how to calculate this, right? This would be 11J. Another way to calculate this is just call this 11J. And this would be 1769 cosine of 15, 1760 plus 1759 sine of a 15J. I just split this into a real and imaginary part. This is the imaginary only because it's only a complex reactance. And this is a real number. Then you add everything, create a vector and multiply that by the complex conjugate or the conjugate of this. I assume that this conversion here is okay with you. Is that a fair assumption? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that is then the current. So this is the current when the motor draws this much power and has a power angle of 15 degrees, which means that it's probably creating, it's probably uh, driving a load. And that is what is creating that discrepancy of 15 degrees with respect to the input voltage. The next question is determine the line current when the load is removed. And when the load is removed, then what is the power angle? Power angle becomes zero. Power angle becomes zero. Now, there is no torque developed in the motor. If there is no load, that becomes now zero. If you look at the expression for the uh, the power here, that becomes uh, sine of zero will be zero. So no power and no uh, mechanical power going to the motor. So we can simply recalculate this current, but now assuming an angle of zero degrees. minus 1728 this would be an angle at an angle of zero degrees now 1768 69 sorry 1769 of course copying this part divided by 11 at an angle of 90 degrees and you can now calculate this to be 40.1 at an angle of 90 degrees or a negative 40.1 at a negative 90 degrees. So 40.1 at a 90 degree angle. I have a question. Yep. Um, if delta equates to zero, wouldn't that make power equal zero and then EF equal zero? It would make power equal to zero, yes. But all power would be uh, going to, it would be a reactive power. I, it doesn't mean that there is no power going into the system. The power, this power is the power that goes to the mechanical part of the motor, right? The reactive power is zero. So it's the real power is zero. The reactive power in the electrical system is then just looping around that inductance. Okay, the next question would be exercise 85. It's very similar to these two. I think I'm gonna leave that one for you as homework and you'll post the solution in the annotated lecture notes. So that's it for today. I uh, have office hours starting at 11, uh, at 10. I extended the office hours today uh, on, on Thursdays by, by another 30 minutes. There has been a lot of demand for extra office hours and which is good. So if you need to meet with me or Ben, 
and all office hours are taken just email us and we'll definitely arrange an appointment outside office office hours if you need to okay and the redesign report is due in a few weeks uh so get us it's, it's time to get it started on the latex file if you haven't done it yet and on your presentation i will post the presentation schedule soon it will be a random uh randomly selected uh and then uh if you have any conflicts with the presentation just let me know all right so i'll see you again on tuesday and again if you need extra help outside of office hours simply email me and we'll arrange an appointment okay have a good day